Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Today in psychology, we are going to introduce our uh, next unit, which is about personality. And we will spend a few lectures talking about kind of the classic approaches to personality, how we think about personality today, and different ways that we can try to assess or measure the type of personality that you might have. Uh, but today we are going to focus primarily on that classic approach to personality. So these will be some theories um, um, that we've looked at over the last century or so that attempt to explain our personality. So let's go ahead and give us a nice kind of working definition for what personality is. Uh, we just finished talking about identity. We talked about Erickson and developing our identity. And sometimes students falsely equate identity and personality when in fact these are two different terms with two different meanings, right? Identity with Erickson, it's who you are, like what you believe in, what your values are, um, you know, how you spend your free time, those types of things. Whereas with the personality, you can see it here, the characteristic pattern of how you think, feel, and behave. And that word pattern is really, really important, right? When we think about um, the different ways that you may feel throughout a given day, well, everyone has felt overjoyed and happy at some point in their life, just like everyone has felt kind of pessimistic and down in the dumps as well. But it doesn't necessarily mean that any of those emotions would be considered part of your personality. To be part of your personality, it needs to be a characteristic pattern. Are you someone who's, who's pessimistic most of the time? Are you someone who is always very bubbly and happy and excited to see people and talk to people, right? This is what we're discussing when we talk about personality. It's these patterns patterns of behaviors, of thought process, of emotion that we tend to see day in and day out. And psychologists are really interested about personality and they're curious about things like, well, what helps implant impact personality? Is it more uh, from our internal genetics, right? Our nature, or is it more impacted by our environment and by our nurture? Um, do we have different personality types? Uh, it's really common to take personality you know, tests online and on your phone, and it tries to kind of define your personality and tell you the type of person that you are. Is there any validity to that, right? Is there truth behind these different personality tests? And, and we'll look at some of those in this unit, and we'll talk about how some of these tests do carry some water and some of them, you know, not so much. And so that's the idea behind this unit and what we are going to focus on. And if we're going to start talking about personality, we have to start with perhaps the most famous psychologist to ever live. This is the person where if you find a random, you know, citizen on the street and say, name one psychologist, this is the person they probably are going to think of. And that is Sigmund Freud. So if we can advance to my slide here, here we go. Sigmund Freud, really interesting character in Sigmund Freud. Um, there are lots of theories that we could talk about for AP Psych. We're going to focus on just a few of them. Recognize that most of the theories we discuss with Freud, we talk about from a historical standpoint and how they impact future psychologists and their theories. And there's a there's quite a bit to Freud that, that we don't necessarily put a lot of value into today, at least from a scientific approach. Uh, but let's go ahead and start by talking about Freud's psychoanalytic approach to personality. And if you recall the different perspectives of the hand, this is dating back to the first week of class, the thumb, psychoanalysis. You might remember that we, we talked about the thumb um, and the, the mnemonic that we used for the thumb to help us remember that that's this perspective might make uh, some sense by the time we're done with today's lecture as far as, you know, unconscious drives and things like that. So psychoanalytic approach. The idea here, according to Freud, is that there is a constant internal battle going on in our mind between these different systems. On one hand, we have what's known as the id, and we are born being id dominant, right? Our mind, our personality is dominated by the id. And the id is sometimes referred to as the pleasure principle. It's the idea that I want that and I want it right now. And so we, are, we have our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions are constantly being driven to satisfy the id. And then what happens is around four, five, six years old, we start to develop this voice in our head. And this voice in our head, what we sometimes refer to as our conscience, right, telling us how we ought to behave, the things that we should be doing, 
Freud refers to that as our super ego, right? The super ego is the idea of this is how you ought to behave. This is what you should do. And then in between the two, between our id and our super ego is the ego, which translates to self. And the ego is trying to find a balance between satisfying the need or the desires, the impulses of the id, but doing so in a socially acceptable way as defined by our super ego. And so if you have someone who is impulsive, who is impatient, who um, you know is, is constantly uh, being driven by these, these internal desires, we would say that they are driven by their id. Or maybe we'd say they've got a really weak superego. They have a weak conscience. Or the reality is if you have a really strong superego, that's not always great either. Sometimes students look at the id and the superego as being like the devil and the angel on the shoulders. And you're familiar with this kind of visual, right? You've seen it in cartoons and the movies and things. It's not a horrible way to think about it, but the reality is it's not a great way to think about it either because the superego is no angel on your shoulder, right? Sometimes the superego causes us to feel guilty when we shouldn't. Maybe you go home and you've worked really hard in school. You've got a test tomorrow and you're like, I need to take a little bit of break before you know I hit the books and study before I go to bed. And there's that little voice in your head that's like, ah, you've got time now. Maybe you should be studying. And you start to feel guilty about the fact that you're not studying. That's your superego, right? So the superego is not this angel. It's saying, this is what you ought to do. But maybe it's important that you find some balance and you take a break when you get home from school. Just like the id isn't really a devil on your shoulder either. Yes, the id is what is kind of driving you toward these primal urges and desires, but it doesn't mean it has to be bad, right? When you're walking around and you get super hungry and you're like, okay, I need to go find food and I need to find it right now, or I'm going to turn into this, you know, really angry person. That's your id. That's your id saying, get food and get it right now before you think about any, you know, doing anything else. And so the the ego, can we find a compromise between these two driving forces in our mind? Now, speaking of the mind, Freud loved to use this particular analogy when talking about the mind, and he used the analogy of an iceberg. I've got an iceberg poster in my classroom. Perhaps you've seen it. And the reason I have it in there is because Freud equates the mind to an iceberg and says that our mind is like an iceberg because of our conscious awareness also because of the way uh, our unconscious mind works. And so conscious awareness would be what is above the surface, just the tip of the iceberg. This is the part of your mind that you can think about and digest and, and, and be curious about um, without any effort, right? What you're thinking about right now. And then right beneath the surface is what Freud referred to as your pre-conscious mind. Your pre-conscious Preconscious mind would be memories and thoughts that perhaps you aren't thinking about right now, but with a little bit of prodding, you can think about it. So if I was to, for example, say something like, try to remember your most embarrassing moment, or think about a time when you have been terrified. Well, those memories, those memories exist in your preconscious mind. They're beneath the surface, and with a little bit of, you know, a little bit of prodding and, and, and some memory cues, you can bring them up and consciously think about them above the surface. But then the iceberg is the intentional symbol because the vast majority of an iceberg is beneath the surface. And Freud says the vast majority of our mind is beneath the surface, most of which makes up our unconscious mind. Not unconscious like if you get hit in the head and you're knocked out, right? An unconscious mind, according to Freud, is the part of your mind that is driven primarily by the id that you are largely unaware of. And so these would be memories from childhood that, frankly, you don't even remember, right? These would be impulses, uh, desires, and drives that exist that you can't even consciously pinpoint, but they are still impacting who you are, how you think, and how you behave. That makes up your unconscious mind. And so 
not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but let's say you are having some issues, maybe you are really anxious, um, Freud would argue, well, the problem that exists, the reason you are anxious is because there is a problem deep in your unconscious mind. And so if we want to help you, we need to tap into your unconscious mind. We need to find a way to dive deep beneath the surface, figure out what's going on, resolve that conflict to hopefully help you above the surface. And there's a number of different techniques that you can try to use to tap into someone someone's unconscious mind. Freud, for example, would talk about dream analysis. He would use hypnosis, things like that, um, to try to get into your unconscious mind. I want to... Um, go a little bit further into this idea of psychoanalytic theory and talk about one of the, the most controversials, uh, controversial elements of Freud's theories, and that is his take on development. Um, we have discussed de development from a number of different perspectives. We talked about uh, development according to Piaget and Erickson and Kohlberg and, and Marcia and things. Um, Freud has his own five stages of what he calls psychosexual development that impact our personality and claims that our personality is a product of the conflicts and resolutions that take place within these five stages of psychosexual development. Now, um, recognize that with these five different stages, uh, Freud was looking at kind of what is the big obstacle that's happening? What is the big milestone that is taking place? And I have this kind of graphic here, and it's there's a, a different uh, graphic in your textbook as well. But to just briefly walk through these, these five stages of psychosexual development. The first stage, the first couple of years, is what Freud refers to as the oral stage. And you think, okay, well, what's the big milestone? What's the big obstacle that's taking place during the oral stage? Well, during this first stage, first couple years of life, right? Infants are incredibly dependent on their caregivers, right? Um, and if we're thinking, okay, what's the big kind of achievement that can take place in this stage? Well, it's the stage when infants be, uh, start to become weaned off of a breast, a bottle, a thumb, a pacifier, you name it, right? Can an infant become independent from this source of gratification that they experience orally, right? Whether again, that's breastfeeding or nursing with a bottle or sucking on a pacifier. And the weaning process can be quite traumatic for some children. If, if you have a younger sibling or cousin and you've seen them, for example, go through the process of weaning off of a pacifier, that can be really, really tough, right? Children can throw fits and they can have difficult times sleeping and be grumpy. Well, Freud is going to argue, you're not going to have any memory of that, but the way that you resolve that conflict will impact who you are today. It makes up your unconscious mind, right? It's this memory of childhood. You don't remember, likely, the process of weaning off of, you know, sucking milk from a bottle or sucking your thumb while falling asleep. You probably don't remember the process of getting over that. But if that was really traumatic, it may impact who you are today. If you successfully resolved that conflict, you are likely someone who has no problem with being independent. But if you struggled with that conflict, then we would say you are fixated, right? You have fixated in the oral stage. And as a result, you might be an adult who is quite dependent on other people. Moving along to our second stage, this is the anal stage, and the process or the kind of the obstacle that we tend to see take place in this second stage, which goes from about two until about three years old, is the process of potty training. And if you think about what this is ultimately symbolic of, it's about control. Do you have control over your body, right? Can you hold it until it's an appropriate time to use the restroom, for example? And so if you are someone who does have control over your own actions and over your own body, you can meet the demands of society, we would say you have successfully progressed through this stage. If, however, potty training was really, really difficult for you, uh, perhaps you were quite rebel rebellious and you refused to go to the bathroom in, in the potty or, or you refused to go to the bathroom at all for as long as you possibly could, right? 
this experience may stick with you. And we would say that you have a fixation in the anal stage where you struggle with control. And this can manifest itself in a lot of different ways, right? It can manifest itself through someone who's very, very uh, particular and, and um, what we call anal retentive, right? They're very picky um, about, about different rules and orders or someone quite frankly, who's, who's sloppy and messy, right? We would say that they have this fixation in this stage as well. Our third stage is what we call the phallic stage, and lots of things happen in the phallic stage. Uh, it's during the phallic stage, around age three until about age seven or so, that children, um, they start to recognize their own biological sex, and they start to recognize whether or not they are similar or different to perhaps their siblings, their parents, other people uh, in their life and in their family. Some other things that happen during the phallic stage is a process called identification. Now, according to Freud, the way that this works is a child will begin to identify with their same-sex parent. And the voice of their same-sex parent will eventually become and develop into their superego or their conscience. Think about that for a moment. Freud is going to argue that when I'm walking around the world, that voice in my head that's telling me what I should do, according to Freud, that's my father's voice. And so before I do something stupid, if there's that voice in my head that says, are you sure this is a good idea? Should you be doing this? Or before I get real lazy and say, oh, I don't really want to do those chores right now. I'm going to just relax on the couch. That voice in my head that says, I think you need to get off the couch and get to work. That's my father's voice, according to Freud, the process of identification. Another kind of interesting that Freud argues happens in the phallic stage is what we call either the Oedipus complex for young boys or the Electra complex for young girls. The idea here is as you identify with the same sex parent, you also start to resent them and become jealous of them. You also begin to have this desire to be with your opposite sex parent. And so this is the idea that young boys in the phallic stage begin to resent their fathers and perhaps have a desire to marry their mothers. Sounds weird, I know. The reality is three, four, five-year-olds, they don't know what marriage is, but they look, they start to look and observe what they see in the home and think, okay, well, here's this marriage. Where do I fit in this scenario? Again, this is Freud's theory. It's over 100 years old, pretty out of date. Uh, family structures today in 2021 are very different. And so, uh, how Freud would would kind of interpret family structures um, in this day of age, quite likely going to be very different, but this is uh, how he approached the phallic stage when he was writing about this. The latency stage, if something is latent, it's kind of beneath the surface and hidden. So during the latency stage, these urges, these desires are relatively dormant. In other words, there's not a lot going on in the psychosexual stage of the latency stage, other than the fact that children begin to bond with peers of the same biological sex. So if you go to an elementary school playground, for example, don't be too surprised if you find the children that are kind of in this seven to 11 year old age, they tend to be uh, participating and playing and spending their time with other children of their same biological sex. And then around puberty, this uh, kind of sexual urge starts to grow once again. And this is what we call the genital stage when um, people are able to form healthy relationships with others of the opposite biological sex. So that's Freud's kind of take on these different stages we progress through. And depending on how you resolve these conflicts within each stage, it can impact your personality. Now, it's worth noting that there are a group of psychologists that are going to kind of revolt against Freud. And they're going to say, some of this is way too fringe theory for me. And we refer to them as neo-Freudians. Neo-Freudians take some of the elements of psychoanalysis and they run with it. They believe in it. And they kind of form this new approach that we call the psychodynamic approach. And so the psychodynamic approach, for example, will still believe in things like the id, ego, and superego. They will still believe in the unconscious mind. They will still believe in what we call defense mechanisms, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But the more fringe theory like 
um, our dreams, our indicators of, of kind of our feelings in this world, um, the fact that we progress through these psychosexual stages, the, the idea that all of our actions are the result of being driven by either anger or sex, right? These more fringe theories are abandoned in the psychodynamic approach of neo-Freudians. Neo translates to new, so these kind of new Freudian psychologists. I have a, hu uh, a few psychologists listed here that are kind of classic neo-Freudians. Um, Adler, for example. Adler is a neo-Freudian, and Adler studied a lot about um, siblings, uh, how many siblings a child has, birth order was really important, um, the personality of a firstborn child compared to the personality of, of a child born kind of as the middle kid or the baby in the family, and Depending on kind of your own personal experience, you may have heard some of this before, where we tend to say, you know, a lot of firstborn children are leaders, a lot of middleborn children are our peacemakers, our, our babies in the family tend to be kind of the rebellious independent ones. This all is based off the foundation of Adler's research on siblings and how sibling order can impact our personality. He also wrote a lot about what's called the inferiority complex and how for some people they may feel inferior to others and it therefore impacts how they think, feel, and act. And for a lot of inferiority complexes, it deals with family dynamics and where you fall within the particular family. Karen Horney is a neo-Freudian who uh, pushed back strongly against Freud's theory that women were all essentially envious of men. In fact, Freud would write about this, this kind of concept or phrase of penis envy, where women were all envious of men and their abilities, and, and both literally and figuratively their abilities. And so Horni is going to push back and say, you know what? Uh, personality is not all about sexual desire. Um, instead, a large element of our personality is based off of our social experiences and our cultural experiences. And if anything, men have womb envy of women because men are not able to give birth to children, the foundation of life. And so she was kind of a strong opponent of Freud. And then perhaps the most famous Neo-Freudian of all is a man named Carl Jung. And the big thing you need to know about Jung, we could talk about Jung for an entire class period. The thing you really need to know about Carl Jung is his take on what he calls the collective unconscious mind. And so it's this idea that there are aspects of our unconscious mind, that part of our mind we are unaware of, that gets passed on from generation to generation. And it helps explain why, regardless of where you are in the world, regardless of what year you are born, there are some themes that tend to show up over and over again. For example, there are themes in Shakespeare that we also saw in ancient Greece and we continue to see in Disney movies today, right? We watched videos about infants and whether or not infants have this kind of innate understanding of good versus evil, right? Can a three-month-old understand uh, elements of morality and revenge? And lots of research says they do, that infants have a very basic understanding of right and wrong. Carl Jung would argue, well, of course they do. That's part of our collective unconscious mind, this part of our mind that is, that is passed down through generations that we all share together. Um, thinking about kind of these, these historical approaches to personality, it's not all psychoanalytic and psychodynamic theory. There is also the behaviorist theory to personality. Remember, behaviorism is kind of the, the middle finger of psychology. And you can use that same understanding of behaviorism uh, in general with how we learn to how we approach personality. In other words, the idea behind behaviorists like B.F. Skinner, they, they will say that our, our patterns of how we think, feel, and, and, and uh, behave are the result of how we've been trained to think, feel, and behave. So that's just a little bit of review. The humanistic approach, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about the humanistic approach yet. That's the, the ring finger in psychology. Um, we will talk more about these two people you see on your screen, Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers, but kind of the, the cliff notes, the uh, the introduction to the humanistic approach for personality, recognize that our personality is, is really this result, according to humanists, um, 
of trying to achieve self-actualization, of trying to be the best possible person that we can, that we all have an ideal self in our mind and we strive to make sure that our actual self, who we are, aligns with our ideal self. We'll talk about Maslow when we talk about motivation and what is it that motivates us to do different things. And we'll talk about Rogers when we talk about therapy and we talk about how can we, how can we become better people. And so I just have one last slide for you today, and it is a, a, um, a strong kind of uh, foundational element of psychoanalytic theory, and that's this idea of defense mechanisms. And we have evidence of defense mechanisms everywhere. Everywhere we turn, we see elements of defense mechanisms. So I like to end on this because a lot of times when we're thinking about Freud, we think, I don't know if I'm buying into all this, like this, his theory kind of seems out there, but it's hard to deny the existence of defense mechanisms. The idea behind a defense mechanism is you are put in some uncomfortable, unwanted situation and your ego is threatened. And when your ego is threatened, you try to protect yourself. You, you have certain thoughts, certain behaviors so that you can continue to exist in this world without hopefully feeling those negative emotions. So denial, for example, is a defense mechanism, right? Some, uh, something is presented to you that makes you feel uneasy, that makes you feel unhappy. And so you go into a state of denial. You refuse to accept the reality that is in front of you. Freud is going to argue that all defense mechanisms uh, revolve around this idea of repression. And we'll talk a little bit more about repression later, but the idea behind repression is if you think about our iceberg, right? You're in a situation that makes you feel uncomfortable above the surface in conscious awareness. So what do you got to do? You got to push it beneath the surface. Repression is this idea where you push those thoughts and feelings that you don't want into your unconscious mind so that you don't have to address them. And a lot of modern psychologists are going to argue that repression doesn't really exist, that we can't really do that. So on one hand, you have the psychoanalytics saying that all defense mechanisms are based off of repression. And on the other hand, you have more contemporary psychologists that say, if you are in a situation that's traumatic, for example, you're probably not going to forget it. If anything, you're probably going to continue to relive it. And so you see this back and forth take place. I have a handful of other defense mechanisms that are listed there. I'm going to go pretty quick through these, and then uh, we'll, we'll see if we can come up with some more examples um, later in class. The idea of sublimation is if you are in a situation um, that that might result in a socially unacceptable outburst, right? So maybe you're in class and you get accused of cheating, or maybe your girlfriend or your your boyfriend breaks up with you and you're, you can feel the rage building up and you're getting really upset. Well, one defense mechanism is we can take that energy and we can transform it, right? Sublimation. We can change that energy into something that is socially acceptable. And so maybe you decide to go run laps around the track, or maybe you decide to do a bunch of push-ups or lift weights to get that energy out. Maybe you decide to write a song on your guitar or write a poem to convert this negative energy into a more appropriate positive energy, that's this idea of sublimation. Rationalization can be summed up in one word, excuses, right? Excuses or justifying. And so you're in a situation, um, maybe you're really late for work and you're late for work because you're not really excited about going to work and you get to work and your boss kind of chews you out and says, what's going on? You're always late. And you come up with this big string of lies essentially, but you might even believe it. You're like, no, I, I, I was late because of X, Y, and Z traffic was really bad. I couldn't get my car started. I forgot to pack my lunch, whatever. Right. This is rationalization. You are attempting to, to justify the reason behind your thoughts, your feelings, or your behaviors that are uncomfortable to experience. Displacement and projection are often confused. They kind of sound similar. Uh, the idea behind displacement is when you take your energy from its source and you displace it to someone else. And so maybe I get called into the into my boss's office, right, the principal's office, and I get yelled at uh, because I'm I'm not giving very appropriate lessons or I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing in the classroom. 
well, I'm not going to chew out my boss if I'm really uncomfortable, right? I'm not going to push back too hard against my boss. That that might only lead to more problems. So instead, what I could do is I could go back to the classroom and start yelling at my students. I've displaced my anger from its source to uh, a, a safer you know, location. Uh, if you have a parent that yells at a child because they're upset of something that happened at work, you're thinking, well, they are displacing their anger to someone else. Don't confuse that with projection. The idea behind projection is when you feel something, you have experienced something, but you claim that that's what someone else believes. So you feel persecuted against and you claim that that applies to another person. Uh, maybe this is the situation where a person goes up to, um, you, have a, you have a student go up to their parents and the student's not doing really well in school and they're starting to doubt their abilities. They have low self-confidence and they go to their parents and they say, you think I'm stupid. And the parent's like, I don't, I don't think you're stupid. They say, yeah, you think I'm stupid. Well, that's projection. That person may think that they are stupid, but they're claiming that someone else is thinking that about them. They are projecting their own internal thoughts to another person. So you can see how that is, is confused with displacement. Displacement is when I go from I'm not going to get I'm not going to yell at my boss because I might get in trouble. So I'm going to yell at someone else. I'm going to yell at my own kids. Projection is I feel something. I feel um, I feel like this relationship is doomed and um, it's going to end. And so I go up to my to my significant other and I say, you think that this relationship isn't going anywhere. You think this is doomed. So you're projecting your own thoughts onto someone else. And then finally, reaction formation. Reaction formation is kind of like overcompensation. And so with reaction formation, you can think opposites, right? And so maybe the way that you are feeling or, or thinking is inappropriate and so you overcompensate and you you essentially give the opposite of how you genuinely actually feel um maybe you have cheated on your midterm exams right and you know that cheating on the midterm exams is wrong it makes you feel bad and so you become this this outward vocal opponent against cheating, right? You talk to your friends about how wrong cheating is. You talk to your teachers about how it's really important to crack down on cheating. Well, you're doing this to try to make yourself feel better to overcompensate for the fact that you did in fact cheat. And so we call that reaction formation, which you just think you are, you are behaving opposite of how you actually feel. All right, lots of terms in this little lecture. The good news is that it's the only lecture for the unit this time um, or for this particular week. If you have any questions while going through the material, uh, don't forget to reach out and, and send me an email. And as always, everyone, best of luck. Oh.